Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the 2021 TEDx Youth at Berwyn Conference. My name is Unuti Gupta, and I'm beyond excited to invite you to our second conference. While we didn't expect our first event to go virtual, we certainly didn't expect to still be meeting with you here today through a screen. But in the TED spirit of ideas worth sharing, we believe that a TEDx event, no matter if it's in person or virtual, can bring a community together. Over the past year, our team has been working hard to grow as individuals and as an organization. Since our last conference, we've expanded from TEDx Youth at Berwyn to Youth at Berwyn, an official nonprofit organization. This expansion has allowed us to implement a variety of new initiatives. For example, our most recent project called Reinventing Career Day, where we're creating a one-year curriculum to teach students about prevalent local and global community issues, like the climate crisis and healthcare reform. We're also implementing virtual entrepreneurship programs and pitch competitions to inspire youth to put their ideas into action. But throughout it all, these TEDx conferences remain at the core of our mission and at the center of our organization. So today's theme, Society and Self, is all about the ways that individual actions can create ripple effects, how a variety of fields and areas of study come together, and most importantly, how your actions as a single person can impact an entire society. So without further ado, thank you and I hope you enjoy. While Society and Self go hand in hand, we cannot impact the people around us until we have an understanding of who we are. Our identities not only dictate our personal lifestyles and hobbies, but they are the driving force behind the ways in which we choose to interact with our local and global communities. Our first speaker is going to show us what finding our identity truly looks like. Saz Ross, a former art teacher and now independent illustrator, is going to explain how it takes getting lost to find your creativity and how it also takes getting lost to find your identity. Get lost. Nice. Oh, I don't want you to leave. Stay. I want us to zero in on the definition of lost. Lost is defined by convention as having no direction, being gone, unattainable, or out of reach. But what if I were to tell you that getting lost means something entirely different? in the creative mindset. But hold on, what is creative mindset? For many, it is a mental barrier, but anyone can access creativity. That's right, I said it, anyone. That means you. It's hard to feel creative though when we've seen our ideas manifested by another time and time again. We say, oh, I've seen it done before, or it's been streamed on YouTube and searched on Google millions of times in its most perfect form. But the truth is, anyone can have an idea, a creative voice and a story that is beautifully unique, extraordinarily creative, and has never been told before. It is up to us to tell that story. And it is up to us to express ourselves with our creative mindset in order to sculpt impactful change in our society as youth, without a roadmap or a final destination. Now let's get lost. A simple acronym can unpack the methodology of lost and redefine its meaning. L, listen to criticism. 
The word criticism can feel a lot like checking your voicemail as a young professional. Do you want to listen to it? No. Do you listen to it? Yes. Why? Because grandma can't text yet. But we do value her messages, especially the ones with five periods, a balloon emoji, and no words at all. The truth is, who gladly wants to admit the fact that they don't know how to do something? Or that they're lost? Creati creativity begins by accepting criticism, assessing it, and then acting on it. Once we accept the fact that we don't know where our next step is, it's time to find the right mentors. The people who genuinely care about your success will not be afraid to give you the hard truth or verbalize your idiosyncrasies. I thought it was a brilliant plan to quit my stable tenure job as an elementary art teacher in a public school system and accept a fraction of what I was being paid in order to pursue my dream career as a freelance illustrator. My husband, who I thought would be the first person to encourage me, criticized me, asking me questions like, how would I file my taxes? And what market of consumers was I trying to target? How and where would I sell my art? I admittedly had no answers to any of these questions and sat there slumped in a chair while he expressed every point of concern. I was lost, but at least I had an awareness of the questions that I needed answers to in order to move forward with clarity and success. According to a 2019 article in the Harvard Business Review on innovation, Author and psychologist Charles Nemeth states that in order to create breakthroughs, it is necessary to leverage the contrasts that come from critique instead of escaping them. Debate and criticism do not inhibit ideas, rather, they stimulate them. Breakthroughs cannot only occur with the proper support system, but with the power of a creative outlet. Oh, own your outlet. Getting lost in your creative outlet will yield itself to brand new discoveries, allowing you to blaze uncharted territories of your creative mindset. But how do we get here? It's easier than you think. 2020 alone has rerouted our lives in countless ways, whether because of job loss or different demands in our consumer culture. For me, pen and ink illustration has not only provided me with a creative outlet, it has allowed me to express pieces of my life that would have surfaced in unhealthy ways otherwise. Let me draw a scene for you. It is the hot summer of 2018 and I'm planning a fall wedding, an event my mother is helping to plan, but will be too weak to attend. Let me tell you about mom for a second. This was a person who would rather binge watch TLC while cleaning the floor then go on an exotic vacation or to a fancy dinner, even if I invited the entire cast of 90 Day Fiance. After years of convincing myself that I was not related to this woman, we started to mend a very broken relationship, becoming closer than ever before. It took my entire life to truly appreciate my mom. And then I come to find that she's slowly dying of a blood cancer called multiple myeloma. As her sickness steadily worsened and hair fell down from her face, aches and pains insatiably feasted on what was left of her. And I dove into the darkest moment of my life. At this point, we knew she had less than a year to live. And all I could think about was how her pain was eating me alive and how utterly lost I felt. In the heat of feeling lost, I pick up something safe, my pen, and I begin to draw something, not just something to make me happy in that moment, but a story. This girl is walking through a dark forest with a rusty lantern. She's following this warm and vibrant light to this tall and whimsical treehouse. Her back is facing the viewer, leaving you curious. Is she sad to be lost, or is she optimistically embarking on a new adventure? Would she ever have found this mysterious treasure of a landscape if she just followed a roadmap? She is me. 
When my illustration loss was featured in a gallery, I got a call from a viewer who wanted to meet with me in person. And I can't lie, it made me feel kind of important at the time. We sat down together in this crowded coffee shop in Baltimore City, and her eyes widened with her smile. She was excited to see me so that she could tell me the impact my work had on her and how she couldn't unsee my design. As she unraveled her feelings about my illustration, she wondered if her theory about the story I depicted was correct. I stated that it did not matter if she was correct. If she cared enough to track down a total stranger to, her, to express herself, I didn't want to confirm or deny her beliefs about my work. I wanted the mystery and inspiration of my illustration to sustain itself by not being tainted by the truth. And then I had a change of heart. I opened up to her about how my illustration was inspired by my mother's passing. And then she opened up to me about losing her mother at the same exact age. At this moment, I had an epiphany. It is not enough to just make something in the trenches of feeling lost. One must marry the concept of making and sharing. Creating is our opportunity to build meaningful relationships in society. I would have not made an impact on any person if not for getting lost in my outlet. As psychologist Alan Castell once stated, an outlet getting lost itself can lead to a deeper learning about yourself, your goals, and your interests. I would have never been able to find myself again if not for getting lost in my outlet. My creative potential and confidence would have never been reached if not for illustrating and sharing my story. S, storytell. One can make an unforgettable impact by sharing a personal story through an art form. When vulnerability and humility is exposed to the masses with creative storytelling, it can create a ripple effect so influential and so impactful that it can allow one to feel comfortable enough to express and access a creative outlet on their own. According to psychologist and neuroscientist Uri Hassan at Princeton University, in a study involving the brain activity of two people, as one person told a story and the other listened, the greater the listener's comprehension, the more closely the brainwave patterns mirrored those of a storyteller. If this is true, how does one tell a good story? Well, in my experience, if you can allow one to envision the five senses of smell, taste, sight, touch, and hearing, then you can truly captivate someone's attention and transport them to an unforgettable space, maybe even a dark and mysterious forest. Sharing a good story with creative mindset doesn't come without its risks. T, take creative risks. Getting lost is a risk, but we must get lost in creativity in order to be found in the eyes of confidence. What does that mean? Shouldn't we always have a plan, a set of directions, Google Maps? How about ways? I love it when Morgan Freeman tells me to make a left turn. As far as problem solving, our minds are habituated and drawn to it. If we are getting lost physically, that means having a heightened sense of awareness in regards to our actions and environment. But how does that link to creativity? True creatives take time to notice the unnoticed. Creatives are willing to take exquisite risks. Right before my mom passed away, I asked her where to look for her in nature as a sign of her presence. She said, I'll be a purple butterfly. Have you ever seen a purple butterfly? I haven't. At first I was upset because I was thinking, how would I ever find her? But then it dawned on me. Beautiful things are not always obvious, which makes them more precious when they are found, just like your creative mindset. So the next time your light goes out and you are unable to see your roadmap, Allow yourself the chance to embrace that feeling because it may surface the most brilliant layer of your creative mindset. 
your purple butterfly. As the extraordinary and unpredictable artist Colson Baker once said, how does one give a legendary performance if you can't get lost in it? There are no rules in art. There are no rules with creativity, and there is always a way to access it with your story. We all have a story that is yet to be told, so how are you going to tell it? We cannot make impactful change without vulnerable marks, words, and performances. Our world needs your artistry in order to see life with a fresh and inspired lens. So what will you do when the light burns out? You'll just have to get lost. Thank you. Saz just showed us the power of identity and what identity really means. Our personal stories are often impacted by both our experiences and our community. Our next speaker, Maria Alexander de Agostino, is going to challenge the conventional definition of identity. She's going to explore her personal story and her struggle with identity and gives you, the audience, a chance to think about your own. This talk asks a short but complex question. Who are you really? And where are you really from? I recently turned 21, an exciting time for a lot of American children, but to me, it was like any other birthday, except for one thing. I really missed home. I moved to the United States when I was eight. As the complexities of my immigration process are all but clear, I do remember one thing. Moving to the United States meant guaranteed opportunities, equality, and freedom that I was not guaranteed in my home country, Venezuela. Like many immigrant children that come to the United States, I was excited about the countless new opportunities I will be given. For me, well, as an eight-year-old, it was more than the 20 different flavors of Ben & Jerry's ice cream, something that to this day, I'm extremely grateful for. But as I began to immerse myself in the American culture and lifestyle, I came to realize that the immigrant rhetoric that we are given felt short of the true hardships that immigrants and minority individuals face in this country. At the age of eight, I began the second grade. Like a lot of American children, I started at the elementary school at my local public school. Now, it might seem easier said than done, but due to the academic difference between Venezuela and the United States, I was put a year ahead of what I would have been in Venezuela in a country where I knew nobody and totally did not know the language. Now, the week, the week leading up to that first day of school was exciting. My mom and I went backpack shopping, and like a true Venezuelan, I got a matching Kipling backpack, pencil case, and lunchbox. I picked up my prettiest of clothes and laid out my prettiest of bows as well the Friday night before school started. That first day came around and I felt like I was on a cloud. People came up to me and asked, where are you from? Where did you move from? Where are you currently living? And most importantly, What's your first language? Now, to me, I've never experienced that question because my accent really gave me away and I didn't know what to reply, so proudly I said Spanish. That's cool, I speak two languages. Didn't think much of it at the time. But that first week didn't last long. That experience where I was on a cloud and I felt like people cared about me lasted no more than a week. As the weeks rolled around, that cloud turned into a thunderstorm and that's when the bullying began. People began to ask me, why I was wearing bows, because apparently wearing bows was for babies. Why I was eating ch uh, chicken milanese and carne mechada, shredded meat with sazon and tomatoes instead of eating sandwiches like they did. But most importantly, they began to question my accent. Everything about my accent became a problem. The constant, what are you saying? I can't understand what you're saying. Why do you sound like that? Why can't you sound like us? These questions that came both from my teachers and my peers turned into a huge cloud for me. I began to reject my ethnicity, my accent, and most specifically, my Venezuelan culture. From that period on, it led me to sit in front of television, watching American sitcoms like Friends, in order to sound like a true American. For me, the depiction of a true American was Rachel Green. At the same time, it led me to put words into Google Translate and just click the Translate button, sit in front of the computer for hours, sounding the same way Google Translate did. It led me to beg my mom to wear sweatpants, which, to this day, she still detests, and even, wear, and even eat sandwiches, which was totally different from the nice home-cooked meals that I used to have before. This experience lasted from my elementary, middle, and high school experience. But college, though, what an exciting thought, moving away to DC, the nation's capital, in order to learn about the intricacies of a legislative and judicial system in order to effectively advocate for change, not only for minority, but also for immigrant individuals throughout the country. I was excited. 
not only to go away as I loved education and I looked forward to this new experience, but also to leave this confused little girl behind as I didn't know where I stood, how I identified myself, how I categorized myself into American societal values. I wasn't Venezuelan enough because I didn't experience my preteen years there, but I also wasn't American enough because I didn't experience the same cultural identity and even cultural growing upbringing that many individuals did. It was a weird middle gray area for me. And to this day, I really don't know where I stand. So that's why college was exciting. A lot of people are like, college is where you find yourself, where you look forward and you learn and you, because of your education, that's where you find your passions and how to effectively bring change, which I was excited for. But as I soon began college, I began to make friends. And like in South Florida, my, South, my home in South Florida, I began to make friends of Hispanic and Latino culture, which was exciting because it felt familiar. But once again, I was the only immigrant, the only individual who had that experience of coming to the United States and being questioned about her ability to speak English, her ability to understand certain words, and most importantly, even questions were being brought up about my current immigration process. Now, my, I know my friends didn't try to make me feel bad about all my upbringing, but these questions that to them it was just 15 minutes of laughter, to me, impacted me tremendously throughout my first and second year at the university. But this experience didn't extend it past my friend group and into my university community. I had a university employee ask me to not speak Spanish because they weren't able to understand what I was saying. But in reality, what I was doing was sending my, my mom a voice note how to use Venmo. And as a lot of us know, that's not easy. It's not as easy as it sounds because majority of the time, I don't even know how to use Venmo. It just click, pay, and that's it. But that being said, I began to realize that this is going to be a sad reality for me for a lot of my life. And I began to question once again my upbringing and my culture and my identity, which I thought I had left behind. Now, as I again, once again stand behind this middle gray area and I found myself questioning my ability to even pronounce certain words or even stand in important rooms where decisions were being made, I felt unconfident and I began to detest myself and everything that I stood for. But it wasn't until my summer going into my sophomore year that I began to realize that not knowing is okay. And what my peers in elementary school used to make me fun of is what makes me who I am. It's what makes my voice powerful and my story move people. It makes my words have power. Now, being a strong, ambitious, determined immigrant female in the United States or pretty much anywhere in the world is not easy at all. But what becomes important that I came to realize during that summer is I'd educated myself, not only politically, socially, and even environmentally, but I began to realize that it's okay, once again, to have this power and have this ambition. I don't have to question myself. And that becomes important because when the idea of where are you really from starts to become extremely monumental throughout many American communities and individuals are asked all over the world, I didn't know what to answer. I wasn't sure if I say, am I Venezuelan or am I American? Where do I fall under this spectrum? But I can actually now say with full-heartedly confident that it is okay to be American and something else. For me, it is okay to be Venezuelan and American. And to this day, I can proudly say that I'm a proud half Venezuelan and half American. As we each find our own paths, it is equally as important to positively influence the paths of others. But does it always have to be one or the other? to help yourself or to help others. Our next speaker, Vivek Pandit, says no, it is possible to do both. The answer lies in social entrepreneurship. As a social entrepreneur himself, Vivek explains how Generation Z has defied the notion that it is not possible to help others while still being personally successful. He will lead us to understand how an entrepreneurial drive can be used for the greater good. So many of you in the audience today or in your middle and high school years. And I remember when I was your age, I started to ask the questions, who am I and what am I capable of? And as I got older and I went to college and work started to become more collaborative, those questions never really went away, but they started to become, who are we and what are we capable of? Well, we are Generation Z, a multifaceted driven group of individuals who have used technology, hyperconnectivity, and instant access to information to accomplish two really unique things. First, innovative thoughts sparked by teenagers no longer have to be filtered through another generation's prism in order to serve the public interest. 
And second, we've been exposed to a multitude of identities, attitudes, and perspectives. And our generation has taken these two things, the ability to have and execute our own ideas, and the inclusion of thoughts and cultures, and combined them to create diverse frameworks in which we can problem solve within and find unique solutions to complex issues. And today, I want to talk about one of those issues, capitalism, and how our generation is not only at the forefront of calling out this flawed system, but has already begun to implement creative solutions addressing the massive inequality caused by it. Now, the problem of rising inequality around the globe is really due to wealth concentration. In 2017, it was announced that eight people own more wealth than the bottom half of the entire world's population. Eight people. Now, it doesn't matter what you believe with regard to rewarding hard work. This is simply not sustainable. But contrary to popular belief, we didn't end up here because all rich people are evil manipulators of a rigged system. In reality, it's that our economic system just works on their behalf. What do I mean by that? Well, wealth acts like a magnet. And the bigger the magnet, the greater the pull. And that's how our economic system is built. But for poorer people, people with no magnet, it's really hard to attract anything. And if you could somehow get a magnet, it's really hard to hold on to it. 250 years ago, when modern capitalism was formed, we all started to preach that free markets would regulate wealth and this invisible force, this invisible hand, would guarantee we had competition in the economy and we'd find this equilibrium that would pay out social benefits to everybody. And many of us grew up hearing that economic growth is the rising tide that lifts all boats. But that saying ignores the plight of millions who are clinging onto leaky rafts or have no boats at all. This antiquated view of capitalism offers no solutions to the current economic problems we face. Sure, capitalism has produced rapid technological advancements, but at the cost of massive inequality. And if we really want to solve this, we can't just rely on philanthropic initiatives and government programs. We need to change the system itself. So how do we do that? Well, first, we need to change our understanding of human behavior. Because right now, we act like everyone is personal gain seeking and making the most money possible is your ultimate goal. And we've structured incentives and the system around accomplishing this goal. And these incentives and the system is enforcing behavior like greed, exploitation, and selfishness. But we all know we would never raise our kids to be intentionally selfish because we aren't capitalistic people by nature. We're just real people. And real people enjoy relationships with other people. And yeah, sometimes we're selfish, but we're just as often trusting, caring, and selfless. And yes, we do work to make money for ourselves, but also to help others and better our society, protect our environment, and spread happiness in the world. But even though this is our reality, we're constantly told by business leaders, government officials, and economists that the capitalistic person reigns supreme. And being selfish is your most rational purpose. And structure is purpose expressed through design. But with a flawed understanding of our purpose, we're getting a flawed design and structure. We're actually making it harder for people to practice the intrinsic selflessness we inherently prefer. So we need a whole new way of thinking. And that's where our generation comes in. Because our generation has combined our belief that our own well-being is integrally related to the well-being of others with our unique problem-solving skills and pretty much figured out that instead of starting with capitalism and asking how do I redesign this thing, we should start with human life and all life on planet Earth and ask, how do we generate the conditions for life's flourishing? And when we look at it from this perspective, two fundamental changes are necessary. First, we need to embrace the concept 
of social business. A type of business that is literally based off of selflessness. A type of business that isn't trying to maximize profit in the short term, but be self-sustaining over the long term. A type of business that doesn't fit in the traditional categories of for-profit or non-profit, but stands alone in its own category for more than profit. And second, we need to replace our assumption that humans are job seekers with the truth that humans are entrepreneurs. That is, we want to follow our hearts, passions, be the creators of our future, and make money doing it. Our individual pursuits of happiness should not be thwarted by capitalism, but rather augmented by the possibilities our economic system provides. And when we look at it from this framework, and our generation is combining these two things, social business and entrepreneurship, and are becoming the leaders of a new field, social entrepreneurship. A type of a field in which you do try and win a large piece of the pie, but you ensure the winnings you collect are distributed fairly, and the resources you collect are used for a greater good. Because traditional capitalism is good for winning ideas to collect resources, like startup capital. But the way these resources are dispersed into society must have an element that is socially conscious and socially aware. And when we look at it from this framework, we see a whole new world of possibility. A world in which Gen Z entrepreneurs on university campuses are advancing renewable energies and technologies and forcing investors to pay attention. Social impact investing is rapidly growing. And by doing this, we're making capital automatically flow into the right direction. As a social entrepreneur myself, I am genuinely inspired every day by what our generation is doing. It's a massive movement that for now seems to be working discreetly in the background, but soon enough will be the revolution that capitalism so desperately needs. Instead of growing up fantasizing about making our first million, our generation is growing up dreaming about how we're gonna help a million people. And social entrepreneurship is proving that if you can execute that, you'll make millions doing it. Because in the world of social entrepreneurship, money and numbers don't lead, they follow. We need to go back to our intrinsic desire to serve the community as a way to feed the self. And when we do that, we will create a fairer system. And a fairer system is a more resilient system. And guess what? Thousands of people from around the world have started to build this new version of capitalism. For example, in Bangladesh, there's a bank called Grameen Bank, and they operate entirely off of trust. No collateral is needed. You don't have to prove your creditworthiness. You don't have to show them any documents. And most of the borrowers are completely illiterate or have no assets. These borrowers are the women of Bangladesh who previously couldn't participate and compete in the financial markets. The idea of lending money to these women is ludicrous and by conventional business standards, impossible to sustain. But today, Grameen Bank lends out over two and a half billion dollars per year to nine million women and enjoys a repayment rate of 98.96%. This proves that we can't put all the blame on free markets. It needs to go to something beyond that, to the way we've interpreted human behavior in capitalistic theory. That's the root cause. Because right now, we've designed a system that restricts who can compete to selfish people. But if we can redesign it and allow selflessness-driven individuals as well, the situation changes completely. The old ways of addressing inequality through charitable donations and welfare programs will not adequately address the current economic disparities we face. Our generation will solve it by breaking away from the traditional capitalistic mindset and embracing selflessness-driven businesses. And when we do that together as a generation, we actually will change this world. And if we all take the lead in solving human problems, we won't just slow down, but as Nobel Peace Prize recipient Muhammad Yunus says, we will ultimately reverse 
the whole process of wealth concentration. And businesses are gonna be forced to allocate time, money, and resources into harnessing the power of our selflessness-driven businesses. And governments are gonna be forced to pass policies that facilitate the creation and expansion of our initiatives. And as a result, the momentum for change led by Gen Z will become unstoppable. We will create a system that provides equal opportunity for all. Thank you. Vivek just showed us the power of Generation Z. We have the drive, motivation, diverse perspectives, but this generation also faces a unique challenge with social media and its impact on our image. So far, we've seen the ways that society and self correlate in a positive light. But our next speaker, McKenna Reeds, is here to show us how to overcome the negative effects that society can place on us through social media, comparisons, body image, and more. There's a chance you could lose all your hair. What? That is literally the last thing that any woman or any man ever wants to hear. I remember standing in the shower in November 2015 with my hands full of my hair in a complete disbelief. Ever since I was young, I've been known for my long, thick, beautiful brown hair. My hair was my identity. Who would I be without it? What would my daughters think of me? Would my husband still love me? How would society react? I'll never forget standing in front of my AP psychology students, nervous and scared, wearing a headband, covering my receding hairline with the last of my hair up in a ponytail and using as much makeup to cover the last of the bald spots. And I started to explain that I was gonna start to look different as my hair was falling out and we didn't know why. Little did I know that this transparency would be the defining moment of my journey. By the end of November, 90% of my hair had fallen out and I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called alopecia, which attacks your hair follicles and causes your hair to fall out. There's no specific cause and physically, there's nothing wrong with me. My mom used to ask me, how do you wake up every single day? And I said, there's no other choice. I have two beautiful daughters at home watching my every move, a family to take care of and students who relied on me. For the next eight months, I did everything in my power in order to grow my hair back from topical creams to medications that compromised my immune system to weekly steroid injections into my scalp for six months. Nothing was working. I had to stop as my mind, body, and soul just couldn't take it anymore. As the great Captain Jack Sparrow once said, the problem is not the problem. The problem is the attitude about the problem. What I'd realized is that for far too long, I'd been focusing on what I was not in control of rather than focusing on what I did have control over, and that was my mindset. I was so focused and so concerned what others thought of me that I forgot what was most important, how I viewed myself. We must look for the silver linings in every situation to understand what we are and are not in control over. I mean, how jealous are you that it only takes me 10 minutes to get ready in the morning to shower, get ready and leave for work because I don't have to shave or wash or dry my hair anymore. Or the fact that you will never know how old I am because I will never have gray hair. What I've learned through this hair loss journey is that hair is not our identity. It is our character and how we show up every single day that defines who we are. For far too much in our lives, we've allowed society to dictate our self-worth. We must stop comparing where we are at on our journey to where other people are at on their journey as we are all different moments, physically, mentally, and emotionally. As you're scrolling through Snapchat, TikTok, or Instagram, and you stop at a photo or a video, and you think to yourself, man, why can't I look just like that? Or why can't that be me? Or why can't I be that confident? Just remember that it took at least 10 times to perfect that picture or that video and the selection of the best filter before they were confident enough in order to share it with the entire world on social media. And yet you are deciding to compare your entire life to a filter. I would not be standing here today if I continued to compare myself to others. Stop comparing 
and be inspired by others. Be inspired by their courage and confidence to take action in their lives. Be inspired by those who are stepping up and pursuing their dreams or helping others or not allowing adversity to ever slow them down. Don't ever allow what someone else posts on social media or ever says about you to ever determine how you see yourself or believe in yourself. You and you alone determine how you present yourself to society. The only time you should ever compare yourself is to who you were yesterday. Celebrate all of your wins, regardless of size, and be proud of how far you have come, rather than judging yourself against others who have been honing their craft for so much longer. And the next time you think you're having a bad hair day, just think of me. Thank you. Now I know how hard it is to sit at a screen for two hours. So let's take a quick break, get away from the screens, and we'll see you back in five minutes.
In the first half of this event, we wanted to give you an understanding of the overarching ways in which we're impacted by those around us, and in turn, how we can affect our communities. And as we go into part two of this event, our team wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the ways in which specific fields correlate and impact one another. More specifically, how you can enact change in a field that you're passionate about. So our next speaker is here to talk about the correlation between diversity and inclusion in the business world. Lakshmi Shamakrishnan, an MS candidate in marketing analytics from the University of Maryland, is here to walk us through the meaning and importance of equity. I love meeting new people. Getting coffee, talking about new ideas, connecting on LinkedIn, it's my favorite part of the day. Whenever someone asks me what my go-to hobby is, I say networking. These past four years, at, as a business major at the University of Maryland, I got the chance to go on these really cool networking trips to companies in New York. During my senior year, one company we were visiting gave us visitor's passes, and all we had to do was simply get our photos taken to be put on our name badges. Our tour ended up being delayed by 10 minutes because it wasn't that simple of a process for me. The cameras were positioned at a particular height and were unable to be adjusted to aim lower, and there were no step ladders provided for me to be able to get my face in the camera frame. So given this, some of the employees had to find another camera, take my photo with that, upload that to the database, and print it out. Before coming to my university and becoming a business major, I was apprehensive, to say the least. Not only because the transition from high school to college is nerve-wracking, but because I knew that the business world was not known for being the most diverse. I have a condition called achondroplasia, which is the most common form of dwarfism. Dwarfism occurs in around one in every 10,000 birds, meaning if there are 330 million people in the United States, only 33,000 of us have dwarfism. You could almost fit us all into the Capital One Arena at the Verizon Center in DC. Basically, that's how small the population is. And because of how small the population is, there was a pretty good chance that I was the only little person or person with dwarfism that these working professionals had been acquainted with. The fact that this New York company didn't have a quick solution to taking my photo was a pretty big indicator of this. And when we're introduced to something that's so different from our version of the norm, we don't know how to address it or how to create space for it. But the important thing here, though, is to be open to learning about how we can do so. There is an accessibility inequity between members of the disability community and people who do find themselves represented in society. It doesn't matter where we are in our career journeys. We have the ability to do our part to close this gap, both as members of this underrepresented population and allies. We need to be aware of the people around us who don't have a voice and bring them into the conversation to feel heard. Now, disability is such a broad term and encompasses so many different types. And in my talk today, I'm specifically going to be talking about my physical disability and physical disabilities generally, but I'm hoping that all of you will take the time to educate yourselves about the different disabilities out there and how we can accommodate each and every one of them. Now, it's not enough to just have one person talk about the importance of disability representation. If we don't see it in the world around us, we're not gonna understand how to accommodate for it or how to be inclusive. There's a concept known as a schema, which is essentially a stereotype, and it's formed based off of what we see in the media and our own personal experiences. For instance, if we repeatedly see members of a demographic group with which we're not familiar portrayed in a certain way in films and advertisements, we're gonna subconsciously make a connection from what we see on screen to what we see in real life. Similarly, our own personal experiences of interacting with something beforehand inform how we interact with things similar to it in the future. People with disabilities don't typically have a voice in the media. So one in five people have a disability, physical, neurological, or cognitive, and yet we don't see this representation in the media we consume, which inevitably leads to a lack of accurate education about this demographic. When we do see disability representation, it tends to be derogatory or comedic even, with Disney having a repeated history of negative portrayals. Some examples I've noted include the Munchkins in The Wizard of Oz, the Seven Dwarves in Snow White, and the Oompa Loompas in Willy Wonka. These characters are often whimsical and dumb and often labeled as weird. And sometimes these characters are fictitious, possibly do not directly use people with disabilities as the butt of the joke. But when the physicalities align with people who have physical disabilities or the behavior aligns with those who have neurological or cognitive disabilities, it's not difficult to draw the connection from what we see on screen to what we see in real life. I remember in high school being asked if I was gonna dress as a leprechaun for St. Patrick's Day or dress as an elf for the Christmas holidays. When young people are exposed to these media depictions, there's a greater chance that these examples will be used to inform their schema of what people with disabilities are capable of. 
especially if this is the only exposure to this demographic that they have. And so begins a chain reaction where these kids and these students grow up to become leaders in the workplace and they get to make decisions about hiring and who they want on their teams. And who do you think they're more likely to pick? Someone who resembles the able-bodied prince or someone who resembles goofy Doc the Dwarf? The problem here is that the people working behind the scenes in these organizations, both in the media and otherwise, aren't always representative of the populations they serve or depict. And that's because, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only 18% of the disability population was employed in the U.S. workforce in 2020. So it makes sense that their perspective isn't usually taken into account when it comes to representation. The fact is, people with disabilities go to school, go to work, work hard, get married, do numerous activities. They live as normally as the next guy, but what we see on screen doesn't showcase this normalization. That's why it's so important to take what you see on screen with a grain of salt, because chances are it's not an accurate portrayal. But how do we break this constant cycle of inaccuracies? We can start by getting the right people in the room in the organizations we interact with every day to make these decisions on representation. In recent years, companies, nonprofits, colleges and universities themselves have generally been working to emphasize more diversity and inclusion in their environments by bringing in people from different backgrounds to apply and attend their institutions. Now, equity is a term that's similar to diversity and inclusion, but I don't, I don't think it's spoken about enough. Equity is essentially about giving everyone the same opportunities and accommodating their abilities to take advantage of said opportunities. In this image, you have three people trying to watch a baseball game. Now, they clearly don't have tickets to the game because they have to watch over a fence, but that's a different topic. And what we see here is the difference between equality and equity. In the image on the left, each person is given one box to stand on to help them see the game. However, this doesn't actually solve the problem for the smallest person. They're still unable to see. Some people need more accommodations than others in order to get the same things done. And that's where this concept of equity comes into play as depicted in the image on the right, where each person is now able to see over the fence and watch the game with accommodations distributed depending on who needs what the most. In college, with the companies I interacted with, I noticed that many of them preached diversity and inclusion, but very few actually walked the talk, and I didn't really see that equity aspect. There was a disconnect between what the companies were saying and what they were actually doing. So I rarely saw someone with my physical disability or with a physical disability generally behind the scenes. In order to solve this problem, what companies can do is work to recruit more people with disabilities to apply. By hiring these capable individuals, companies would then be able to get that representation behind the scenes. Now, hiring more people with disabilities and getting them behind the scenes, that checks off the requirement for diversity. But then these companies would need to foster an environment where these people would be able to be respected and listened to and heard. That checks off the requirement for inclusion. But what about equity? So with the company I visited in New York where I needed to get my photo taken, that equity seemed to be missing since those accommodations were not readily available. By hiring these capable individuals with disabilities and allowing them the space to decide where accommodations may be needed, these companies would be able to grow their understanding and awareness of how people with disabilities can function in the workplace and in society. Now, I, I don't think I can directly tell this New York company what to do and tell them to make their services more accessible. What I can do, even as a student, is affect small changes here and there in my immediate community to get that equitable ball rolling. And that's what I've been doing. In some of the restrooms at my university's business school, the soap dispensers are placed along the far wall on the other side of the counter, unable to be reached by people with physical disabilities that affect their height. I made it a goal to promote accessibility in the form of additional reachable soap dispensers. It took me a good three years to summon the courage and the credibility in order to bring up this design flaw with the building services team, primarily because I was seemingly the only person actually affected by this issue. And so throughout college, what I did was take on leadership positions and grow and expand my network in order to build up that reputation and that credibility. And what I realized was that every interaction that I had with my fellow students and my faculty members could be used to inform and alter their schema about what little people and hopefully by extension people with disabilities are capable of. And so I gained allies to help me advocate on part of this restroom accessibility initiative. And I was grateful for that, but that experience isn't universal. And even though new soap dispensers were installed, the job still isn't done. So what we need to do now is focus on what else is missing, whose needs are not being served, and why. In order for an organization to best serve those populations that benefit from or will benefit from their services, 
they need representation from said populations and allies to help speak on behalf of them to be part of the decision-making processes. And even though I was really the only person affected by the soap dispensers at the time, my addressing this accessibility issue clears a path to provide the service for other students with these physical disabilities who will attend the school in the future. Accessibility isn't just being able to reach a soap dispenser, take a photo from a highly placed camera. It's the need to access all places where decisions are being made, decisions that affect us and others to come. Right now, it kind of seems like a catch-22. So in order to change representation, we need more people with disabilities to be behind the scenes. But a reason that people with disabilities aren't behind the scenes as much is because of current representation. Can this issue be solved overnight? No, but I'm hoping that all of you will take these next three steps with you to start changing your perceptions yourselves. First, and this is so much easier said than done, but keep an open mind about what you see on screen. So this is typically the only representation that people with disabilities have, but it's not accurate. So try not to let it affect your perceptions about this underrepresented demographic. Second, take a look at the public areas around you. What are some of the activities you do every day? Go to a coffee shop, get on a bus, walk on a curb. A professor of mine recently had knee surgery and was talking about how difficult it was to navigate these everyday activities while on crutches. Some people with certain physical disabilities face this difficulty every day of their lives. Next time you're out and about in public, take note of these public spaces to grow your awareness of these accessibility issues. Finally, if you are someone who sees themselves represented, if your voice is typically heard, you can be the ally to help clear room at the table for people whose voices normally go unheard. Pay attention to the people around you, listen to them and bring them into the conversation. You may be able to learn about something you've never even considered before. I'm hoping that this talk helps begin bridging that disability education gap and that each and every one of you takes what you heard here today to help us get to a more accessible and inclusive society. Thank you. Inclusivity is a critical factor, not only in business, but in classrooms and offices all around the world. However, inclusivity is not just a human problem. It's a technological one as well. The rise of computer generated algorithms has led to advancements across the globe but it's also come with its fair share of problems. Our next speaker, Pranavi Pratifa, a student passionate about technology and algorithms, is here to explain the bias prevalent in these algorithms that surround us, but more so how this is a solvable problem. It's that time of week again, Friday night, pandemic style. Around this time last year, like most of you, I decided to settle in for a cozy night on the couch with the TV remote instead of any wild Friday night adventures with COVID hanging around. As I browsed through Netflix, I passed the movie I watched yesterday, a cheesy rom-com recommended by a friend, completely not my style. I quickly moved past it and landed on the recommended for you category. I eagerly began browsing through this one, since this was where I found most of the good movies I ended up liking. Suddenly though, I sat bolt upright since yesterday, almost all of the movies in my recommended for you were now rom-coms, each one cheesier than the last. I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels like Netflix seems to know me better than myself sometimes. But this scenario got me thinking, how did Netflix know what I watched yesterday? And how were they able to recommend movies similar to that one for me to watch today? To answer that question, we need to think about what an algorithm is. This is a pretty popular buzzword many of you might have heard before, but what actually is an algorithm? An algorithm is simply a list of steps to solve a problem. In the technology world, algorithms consist of computer implementable commands that allow you to perform computations. In fact, Algorithms are what Netflix uses to generate the movies in the recommended for you category that I had such a bitter experience with last year. Oftentimes, algorithms that are used in artificial intelligence or machine learning, where we try to get the computer to imitate human behavior, are created using data. The best way to mimic human behavior is to analyze how we humans behave through our actions. For instance, when Netflix writes their movie recommendation algorithm, they likely harness data from the millions of people who use their services to predict how humans behave when it comes to watching movies. For example, if one user, such as myself, 
watches the first to all the boys movie, then they'll likely watch the second one and then the third one. What Netflix does is compile this trend of movie watching into a big database, which it then sends to the computer to look for patterns. Most people, after they've seen the first part of a movie series, will likely watch the second. The algorithm's job is to recognize this pattern from the data, use it to create a model of what the correct output is given an input, and then apply this model to other users. This is one of the ways in which Netflix's algorithm produces the movies we see in the recommended for you section, which is why those movies are often similar to ones we've seen previously, whether that is by content, genre, or actors. The idea is that computers can learn on their own when given instructions to follow or data to mine and thus mimic human behavior. But what this idea doesn't encompass is the fact that computers are fundamentally not humans. As such, they lack many of the things we humans take for granted when it comes to making decisions, such as common sense, ethics, and logical reasoning. This is where the problem arises. Before algorithms existed, humans made all the decisions. Now, computers either make decisions for us or heavily influence how we make decisions. Whether it's something simple, like deciding which movie to watch next, or something more serious, like determining the fiscal creditworthiness of an individual to give them a loan. But these computers aren't learning from thin air. They're learning from us. Machine learning algorithms rely on human data. They need data to understand how we humans behave and act in terms of concrete, hard behaviors. They then use this data to replicate human behavior and make tasks simpler. The problem arises when the data that is being passed to these machines is flawed. This is when we run the risk of teaching a computer the wrong thing, or in other words, create a flawed algorithm. The fundamental cause behind why such a phenomenon occurs is this. Computers rely on data, and data comes from human behavior. However, human behavior often represents what is rather than what should be. And what is is often racist, sexist, xenophobic, and so on. As recent events in the US have illustrated, our society holds systems of institutionalized discrimination and oppression that have been at play for generations. As such, it isn't shocking that any data we collect from people in our society will be biased, whether that is against certain ideas, beliefs, groups of people, or traditions. The machines we are more heavily relying on day by day are biased. Why? Because they're learning from us, and we are biased. It may seem like this issue is so far removed from society. What does bias in tech algorithms have to do with us? Well, aside from influencing the movies Netflix recommends for us, there are other uses for algorithms that can impact our lives quite heavily. One such example is employee hiring algorithms. A recent prime example of how this algorithm became flawed lies with tech giant Amazon. Taken together, Amazon's global workforce is over 60% male, with 75% of managerial positions also held by males. The data that was fed to their employee hiring algorithm allowed it to learn that women were a minority at this company. And thus, it penalized any resume it came across that contained the word woman in it, leading to gender bias in how employees were hired at this top company. Another example can be seen with offender risk assessments. What are these? Well, US judges use automated risk assessments to determine things like bail and sentencing limits for individuals accused of a crime. These assessments rely on large data sets that go back ages and include variables like arrest records, demographics, 
financial stability, and so on. The algorithms that these assessments are based on have been found to be inherently biased against African Americans by recommending things such as detainments, longer prison sentences, and higher bails for them in comparison to an equally likely to reoffend white counterpart. When we think about it, this isn't entirely surprising, though completely atrocious. There has been a long history of marginalization and racism in our society that the data set to use to create this algorithm most likely reflect. As such, the algorithm has learned to recommend actions that continue to oppress African Americans, because that is what the data set it was trained on shows. A more close to home example can be seen with facial recognition software. We use this algorithm every time we unlock our iPhones. However, what we may not know is that facial recognition, though outwardly proven to be over 90% accurate, is actually not this accurate for everyone. As the image illustrates, facial recognition varies in accuracy depending on the demographic of the user and is most inaccurate for darker females, illustrating the bias hidden within this algorithm. Though companies that make the software have since announced commitments to modify testing and improve data collection, it's important to note the widespread prevalence of facial recognition in our society today and as such, the damage that this flawed algorithm has already caused. Not only do we use it in our phones, but law enforcement, employment offices, airports, security firms, and more, all use facial recognition in multiple capacities. What if law enforcement incorrectly flagged an innocent darker female as a criminal, while failing to identify the real perpetrator? What if this happened over and over and over again? Can we imagine the terrible effects that would have? It may seem bleak to begin scratching the surface of how technology can be taught to imitate human fallacies and bias, creating long-lasting and far-reaching negative impacts. But there are ways we can improve the situation. One way is to widen the breadth of data used to create these algorithms. If we give computers more varied and diverse data to learn from, we can help ensure that they are learning correct patterns within human behavior that accurately reflect what we want them to do. Another way is to rally together in demanding increased transparency when it comes to creating these algorithms. Within the past few decades, tech giants like Facebook and Google have harnessed tremendous amounts of personal data to create powerful machine learning technology with little insight or oversight from the public and government. This means that only a small subset of people oversaw the creation of something that a large subset of society is using, which can inherently lead to bias. We can fix this by instituting policies that govern when and how personal data can be used as well as by incorporating the work of diversity and equity leaders in the creation of these algorithms. A final way we can improve the situation is to explore more deeply into the idea of teaching machines societal ethics. For instance, widely held beliefs like innocent until proven guilty, common sense reasoning, and the elimination of logical or emotional fallacies. It is more important now than ever for us to educate ourselves about bias in machine learning algorithms, a dangerous phenomenon that gives us a dark insight into how technology, often thought to be created by humans for humans, can turn ugly. As we've seen, our society has systems of bias embedded within it. It is our job to ensure that this inequity and unfairness does not widen its spread into the realm of technology, specifically within artificial intelligence. I hope for you all today to leave not only with new knowledge about an issue within the technology world, but also a heart filled with empathy towards those oppressed by systems in place and what we can do to combat those systems and create meaningful change using computer science.
technology is a powerful field, one that only seems to be getting stronger and stronger as our society pivots and remains in a remote workspace. It is incredibly important for us to recognize and understand this power so we can use it to our advantage. It is up to us to ensure that technology and artificial intelligence is working for us, not against us. Thank you. Delving into the intricacies of scientific study is oftentimes a starting point for not only innovation, but also change. However, the field of science is vast and the solutions to problems are not always clear. Our next speaker is Katie Hurlba, someone with experience as both a sustainable engineer, but also as a burnout prevention coach, who provides a unique perspective on how two seemingly unrelated topics are actually intertwined. This talk will compare personal burnout to the burnout that our planet experiences and explains how taking care of ourselves first may just help us take better care of our planet as well. Growing up, people used to call me the Energizer Bunny because I could just keep going and going and going. And that helped me get into Stanford, earn two engineering degrees, and start a career in green infrastructure. My boundless energy served me really well. Until one day, it didn't. Because it turns out, the Energizer Bunny has a dirty little secret. Eventually, its battery does run out. And the same is true for the environment and us, though we sure don't act like it. Instead, we keep on using and using and using resources and energy from people and the planet with no respect for boundaries or our need for rest. It's no wonder that we're experiencing a climate and mental health crisis at the same time. That is no coincidence. Those are two sides of the same coin. The earth is burning out and so are we. But unlike the Energizer Bunny, we don't have a spare battery lying around. That's why if we're serious about solving the climate crisis, we have to prioritize our collective mental health. And nobody knows this better than Generation Z. In 2019, 1.6 million of them from over 125 countries skipped school to protest climate change. That is legendary. It's also sad because it's a reminder they're inheriting a climate near collapse. Things are so bad that according to the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we only have until 2050 to stop using fossil fuels altogether. That means we have to transform every single bit of our built environment from the way we clean the water in your faucet to the way we produce electricity from your switches to the transportation you use to get around. Systems that took us over 200 years to build and we have to flip them in less than 30. Pause. What's your breath doing right now? Take a deep inhale and slowly exhale. Notice how you feel. Now there's good news. From an engineering perspective, we have the technology to get the problem solved. From a mental health perspective, it's a different story. Cue the sobering statistics. In 2019, the Imagine America Foundation surveyed 20 million US college students, and here's what they found. 84% of them were burnt out. 42% of them were so depressed, they were finding it hard to function. And 12% had seriously considered suicide. The rest of us are struggling right along with them. According to the CDC, between 2015 and 2017, the US life expectancy dropped. That's the first time it's done that since World War I. The cause? An increase in deaths due to despair, which means suicides, drug overdoses, and alcohol-related liver disease. Adding insult to injury, a 2015 study by Stanford professor Jeffrey Pfeffer found that 120,000 US deaths each year can be attributed to workplace stress, which at the time made it the number six cause of death. Before you go thinking this is just a US problem, let's jump over to the UK. According to the National Statistics and the Health and Safety Executive, 
in a 12-month period between 2019 and 2020, the entire UK labor force lost a cumulative 17.9 million days of work due to stress, anxiety, and depression. And according to the World Health Organization, at least 264 million people across the globe suffer from depression. This was the state of our mental health before COVID-19 ever began. And this is how well we, the people charged with solving climate change, are not doing. Pause again. What's going on in your body? Take your arms out to the side. Now really do this with me, okay? And bring them up like you're doing a jumping jack for five, four, yeah, three, two, one, and relax. Notice how you feel now. But what is climate change and what is burnout? And since when do they have anything to do with each other? Well, at their core, climate change and burnout are stress responses. They're attempts by the planet in your body to find balance. Here's what that looks like for Earth. When we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide is like the best NFL wide receiver you have never heard of. It is excellent at making interceptions. Trouble is, what it's great at intercepting is heat and energy that the Earth is literally trying to release into outer space so she can cool off. But she can't. And instead, we get global warming, which stresses out the climate. That's why in places like Australia and California, we have extreme heat driving mega droughts and mega wildfires. It's also what's causing extreme rainfall and rising sea levels that's putting infrastructure and drinking water at risk at island nations like Palau. And because we aren't separate from the earth, we are a part of her. What we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. And what we do to ourselves, we do to the earth. So for humans, burnout looks a lot like losing motivation, productivity, energy, and mental health. All things that come in handy when trying to solve climate change. And an experience I am intimately familiar with. See, at the age of 14, this energizer bunny went into hyperdrive around college prep. I loaded up on all the AP classes, extracurriculars, and volunteering, played two sports, pulled regular all-nighters to get everything done. And I got in to excellent schools. I also got sick every year. Lost so much weight that I had to stop playing the sports that I loved and was exhausted all the time. And things didn't get better when I got into college. At one point, senior year at Stanford, I was so depressed and anxious that I couldn't get off my parents' couch for weeks. I was officially burnt out. Just like the earth, my energy balance was off and my body was producing its own version of wildfires and floods to get my attention. But I didn't listen. At least not until one day, one year after graduation when I got admitted to the ICU with a really bad infection and a 50-50 shot at surviving. It was the first time in my life that I couldn't just push through my stress. Instead, laying stone still in a hospital bed with 12 tubes coming out of me and an oxygen mask strapped to my face, I had to learn how to actually manage it. And even though I had never been to yoga, meditated, or gone to therapy, somehow something inside me figured out how to use my breath, body, and brain to stay calm. And thank God it did, because I don't know if I'd be here to tell you this tale otherwise. Pause one more time. Where's your attention right now? Is it still here with me, or has it wandered? Bring it back to the room by focusing on one thing you can see or hear right now. For instance, that light is on. Notice how you feel. I'm excited to share with you what I learned from that experience in three simple frameworks that have helped me to take way better care of myself and the planet. 
The first one is called the three R's, and it's the umbrella that houses all the goals, which are to recognize, relieve, and reduce stress, whether it's yours or the planet's. Here's how it works. We as humans can recognize and relieve our stress by paying attention to the three Bs, our breath, body, and brain. Just like the planet is always telling us how she's doing through changes in the climate, your body's always telling you how you're doing through changes in what you're thinking, feeling, and how you're breathing. Remember those exercises we just did? Well, they were opportunities for you to use your breath, body, and brain to recognize stress. And the tools we used afterwards were breath, body, and brain stress relievers. Pretty cool, huh? Here's my favorite part. It's the final R, reduce. If we really wanna reduce climate change and burnout, we have to tackle them at their stress roots. And we do this by being a boss, which is an acronym that stands for boundaries, ownership, support, self-compassion, and the bonus S of service. Boundaries are permission for you to define success on your own terms, based on your values, and they honor the fact that limits and rest actually help you achieve success. Ownership is taking accountability for holding those boundaries and responsibility for the consequences when you don't. Support is about sharing our resources, giving help generously to others, and humbly receiving help in return. Self-compassion is the art of not beating yourself up while you're trying to figure out how to set boundaries, own them, and ask for support. And finally, service is the radical act of imagining a better existence for all of us and then courageously showing up for it, even when it's hard and scary. Now let's be real. None of these things are nearly as hard nor complicated as reversing climate change. They are just as important though. We can prevent climate breakdown if we're willing to stop going and going and going and start prioritizing our mental health like the essential climate solution that it is. Let's give the planet a chance to reset by first learning how to do that inside of ourselves. Thank you. As this event comes to a close, we return to the core of our theme, society and self. At the center of this theme are conversation and people, two factors that are so incredibly important when it comes to change. Our final speaker for this afternoon, Jacob Wittenberg, artistic creator and musician, is here to walk us through the power of connection, interaction, and most importantly, the power of listening. The best way to use my voice is to silence it. A year ago, I probably would have told you something completely different, but in this short amount of time, I've completely reversed the way that I think about creativity. You see, the best ideas are executed beyond a unilateral vision, by entrusting others with its direction. What inspired me were ideas, but what empowered me were the people that I shared those ideas with. Because trusting my ideas exclusively, that was a self-inflicted barrier. So today I wanna to discuss how investing in others and empowering others comes back to strengthen your mission. But first, let me ask you this. We're taught to trust our gut, but what if your ideas can take my ideas so much further? Should I let your imagination take control? Especially when giving up control was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. We spend many days and nights and hours building a vision, turning it into reality. So why would I hand it off immediately, especially when trusting our gut is the easiest advice to take? And why would you take my advice? Me standing right here, I don't know your story and you don't know mine. But what I do know is that when I forgot what I knew, that's when I felt my ideas begin to move. So let's get moving. I talk to young creative people every single day, people who inspire me in ways that truthfully I can't even fully comprehend. This is my circle. These are the people that I trust. 
But am I fully exercising my circle if I'm not adopting their advice, implementing that feedback, and ensuring that they are heard? And am I being a good member of their circle? This is where I want to introduce the idea of mutual empowerment. Meaningful human exchanges in which our ideas flourish under the eyes of a greater application. Now, of course, that's easier said than done. So let's be tangible. Let's break this down and let's make sure you walk away today knowing exactly what your next steps are. These are the three pillars to mutual empowerment. First is control as a cycle. Gaining control by giving it away. It sounds a bit contradictory though, right? Well, hang with me here. Think about trust. Who do you trust? My best guess is that you trust the people that trust you. You have to give a little to get a little. Control is the exact same way. Think about it this way. Think of a shield that holds your vision together. The more we connect, the greater that shield grows. Again, you and me, we don't know each other's stories, but if we do connect, we can discover maybe holes in our thinking, maybe some unconscious bias that we didn't know it was there, and we can apply new experiences and new ambitions to our idea to welcome more people in. The collaborative environment is where you will find full fulfillment. But you also may be thinking, does including a ton of people in my vision, does that lead to conflict? Well, I'll ask you this. What's the prerequisite to a resolution? Conflict. So don't think of conflict as something negative here. Think of conflict as the catalyst to your resolution and don't think of control as something that fits in the palm of your hands. Think of control as your catalyst to a resolution. The second pillar is applying your external focus. I work with young creative people every single day across all areas, across all industries, across all ambitions, and there's one thing that they all have in common. It's that their best ideas, their best moments, their best highlights all come from the unplanned. Because embracing the unplanned, that's where you really fall back in love with your idea. You find love within your audience and you fall back in love with yourself as a creator. I wanna share with you a quick story. I talked to one of my favorite creators. She's incredibly smart. She was thinking of a sustainable option to the paper and plastic cups that we have our morning coffee in, which is my favorite part of the day, which is where she got my attention. So I began thinking with her. She was talking about how she was having a hard time learning to invest and market to a wide audience like of coffee drinkers like you and I. But she found subtle hints as she was marketing. There was a greater alliance out there, a greater network that would really push her product. The baristas, the coffee shop owners, the people who would actually push and follow and adopt that same sustainable idea. So she took a step back. She applied that external focus and she made sure to invest in that audience. She built an exponential network, a new network to audience to and found greater fulfillment there. But you may also be thinking, if I'm constantly engaging with people over and over, am I ever going to cross the finish line? Well, I would argue and say that the best never do. And something that the best always do is work on their relationships. That's pillar number three. Now, this may be a bit easier to define in terms of reciprocity, but think about it this way. In every working relationship that I have, I always like to say I'm their number one fan, which I may not be in their eyes, but I tell myself I'm always fighting to be because a piece of advice I know you've heard before is that actions speak louder than words. And I won't disagree with that piece of advice, but I will add on to it a little bit because if you seek active input, you have to show active consideration of it. Because prioritizing relationships, that dissolves those self-inflicted barriers. That ensures that circular development. But you may also be thinking, we're young, we're new to this, we're creating, let's work on ourselves and our own professional development. And I'll be the first to say, I have the exact same thinking. If I'm gonna work on myself, it's gonna be me. If I'm gonna work on anyone, it's gonna be me. But I'll also share with you one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received. And that's that your internal growth must outpace your external growth. 
lay your foundation, ensure the collaboration is there, not just the relationships between team members, but who you are as a team member. That foundation is critical and will set you up for positive success in collaboration. Now, you're probably watching today because you understand like me that young entrepreneurship and youth creativity is new and it's contagious and it's exciting. And I'd say you probably hold a larger role in society and industry than you may realize. So if you want to lead, you'll understand and implement mutual empowerment. You'll understand that the days of fierce competition in zero sum games are over. You'll understand that success is not limited. And you'll understand that our best is just that, ours. The best way to use your voice is to silence it. Because what you do with what you hear often speaks the loudest. Thank you. So I hope after hearing these talks, you're not only eager to learn more about each individual topic, but are also inspired to become more involved in your community. While it can often feel as though there's simply too many problems in this world to solve, this event today has showed us that change doesn't have to be an enormous act. You have the power to take your individual passions and convert them into a source of positive change. We also want to thank everyone who has made today possible. Thank you to our sponsors and donors for backing this event. Thank you to our speakers for bringing your unique ideas to the stage. And most importantly, thank you to you, our audience, for being a vital part of our TEDx Youth at Berwyn community. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you.